Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. It's, I'm Phil Collins, I'm a columnist on The Times and a former chief speechwriter of Tony Blair on the other side of the divide. And it's always a great joy to gather in Manchester, um, partly because it's such a great place, my hometown, but also partly because of the wonderful historical irony of gathering here in Manchester. You can go into Albert Square and see the statues of those great radical liberals whose great cause of free trade caused the Conservative Party to split in 1846, and one faction under the auspices of another great man of Manchester, or very in fact, Robert Peel. And <clears throat> those ideas of markets and freedom and openness have really dominated and, and won the argument on the economy over the intervening 150 years. But over recent times, they're also starting to come into public services and into the public realm. And what we're going to discuss today is the extent to which those notions of openness and, and market mechanisms, rather than markets themselves, are appropriate in the public services. This is something that the major government began to work on really quite extensively, was at first abolished by the Blair government, then reinstated, uh, wasting a number of years, uh, and that are now picked up by the coalition government. Last week in Brighton, I think Ed Miliband and Andy Burnham in particular signalled a change of direction from Labour, um, a, a hostility to that course of direction which the government in which they served had, had continued. So those are the things we're going to discuss, and we're very lucky to have Sean Worth, who's going to kick us off in a moment. Sean was policy, uh, from Policy Exchange, but was in number 10 with David Cameron working on precisely these questions. So Sean's going to set the context, and I'm going to come to the other members of the panel for responses. And then to you for some ideas and thoughts too. Sure. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, yeah, just I just kick off by a sort of scene setting, really. Um, uh, starting by looking at the 2015 general election, basically whoever wins that is going to face exactly the same situation. We've got um, a public sector that's, that's frankly being cut in most parts at a time when the population is both growing and aging. So the the demands on all of that um, activity are going up while the money is coming down. It's a very, very simple formula that sets out the problem. The backdrop to that, of course, also is the fact that um, large swathes of our public sector, which, which grew massively under the previous government, it's not a political point, just to, you know, they, they spent a lot of money, um, <coughs> not terribly wisely, as people like the Institute for Fiscal Studies have shown, you know, um, the spending ballooned, employment ballooned, but the performance, the results that came out of that additional spending uh, didn't match either expectation or just what people want and need from the services that they pay their taxes for. In some areas, of course, that investment was absolutely vital in, in health and in education, particularly where there'd been underinvestment, but largely um, big problems with the amount spent big problems in the civil service with skills and commissioning the right people to uh, help provide services and we've, we're still seeing problems of that nature right now. Um, the debate over how you reform that however I think is is rather bizarre because all of the evidence we see around the world is that um, increasing provider diversity it doesn't have to be the private sector but, but anyone it can be internal markets within the public sector helps, it gives people more choice about where they get their services from, and that, that force of competition, whether it's internal or with the private sector or whatever, is a, is a genuine force for improvement, uh, higher productivity, and, and a whole load of benefits. Now, competition can be a bad thing in certain areas, so, you, so it's not a blunt instrument that you should, that you should use, but, but targeted properly, it gives people better results. Um, the other side of that is information and transparency. For the first time, we're seeing the government publishing more and more information about the public sector, not nearly enough. It should, there should be tons more out there. It should be in formats that ordinary people can see and understand. But we are seeing for the first time, for example, 11 hospitals put in special measures. Right now, they're in special measures because the government, for the first time, has started exposing some of the results. And that, that you know, <coughs> it's been shown that they've been providing unsafe care or they're financially uh, what are called basket cases, unkindly, or both, you know, and, and there's, there's a real problem. In schools, we've got demographic pressure, um, you know, 
clogging up the system because we've got opposition to creating new free schools in local areas um, in order to help that. So, and, and only yesterday we had this big march uh, in Manchester by the TUC, who I, I debated with a guy last night and congratulated him on the fact that he got 50,000 people out on the street to campaign against the privatisation of the NHS when it's not actually happening. But, you know, <laughs> this is the level of debate we've got. So we've got these huge problems and a bizarre debate about how to fix them. I'll finish by saying the solutions are happily for politicians, if they will only grasp on that and get on with it, exactly what ordinary people and families want. They are about more competition, especially in failing services like these, these 11 hospitals I think should just be opened up to the best possible providers to come in and sort them out. Not, not selling them, not, not owning them, but operation and management. Uh, people agree with that, even public sector workers, the majority of public sector workers we told agree with that prospect. They want a lot more choice, which relates to that, that first point, diversity of, of providers coming in, and they want a hell of a lot more information about what on earth is going on, so they can see what these services are providing, and which ones that they should choose for themselves. So, my, uh, my view is that we've got, we've got a real problem, whoever wins that election, We've got solutions that we can use, but we've got a very bizarre political debate, very febrile, and that seems to be the only stumbling block to me, just as getting over this, this issue uh, of people believing the public sector is different to other sectors and, and therefore we can't <coughs> touch it and we must listen to the vested interests who control it. So as long as we get rid of that and, and overcome that, I think we can start moving forward. Thank you. <coughs> sure. Thank you. Can I just ask you one question? You, you, you said something intriguing early on. You said there are times when competition can be a bad thing. Mm. Could you just said, say when you think that is? Yeah, I mean, there, there's basically competition can be based on, on price, where you put a service up for tender and, and you let people compete on, for price. Bins and stuff like that is, is a great example where that works. If you do that in areas like the NHS, it damages care because people compete to provide the cheapest in a very complex area where you've got vulnerable people, perhaps, you know, you don't want the cheapest uh, budget provider, you know, trying to do your hip operation, you want the best. And actually, if you focus on quality, you'll often find in areas like that, um, you get savings in the long run anyway. So, price competition versus provider competition, right. very clear distinction. Okay, let, let's come to uh, Dr. Mary Bowster. The, the other day I was introducing a speaker, and I, I made the mistake of saying that she'd had a long career in something, she looked at me as though I insulted her, so I'm not going to say that. So you've had a distinguished career in uh, teaching and lecturing and is now the uh, General Secretary of the ATL and a member of the Executive Committee of the TUC. Mary. Thank you very much, thank you. Uh, well, I'll be brief. Um, I'll start with just to directly post to Sean's uh, issue about what the, the, um, the issues around free schools. The issues around free schools are not that there has been um, effective opposition, the issues are that the government has lost control of uh, where schools are built and how many schools are built because it refuses to allow local authorities to commission to build uh, schools and as a result having no national planning we're now faced with a places crisis. We're also faced actually because it's lost control of national planning with a teacher training crisis. It's moved to an unsustainable model of teacher training to let schools do it and the idea that the market simply can easily provide for complex pu public services is quite shit clearly. I mean, it's an extraordinary position for government to be in. Not to know now, the government does not know how many teach trainee teachers it's got on training courses, <coughs> and it's not in the position where it can actually <coughs> enable schools to be built in areas of need. And when you consider that the majority of free schools have not built, been built in areas of need, in fact, they've had to come in now and take a hand and say, you can't have a free school unless there's, um, unless there's a need for school places. So that just shows some of the issues around just letting the market rule. I would say, in terms of the reform of public services to give a better service, there are some things that governments always say. The one thing that governments always say is, we're not interested in structural reform, we're interested in the quality of the service. What they then do is immediately move into structural reform, massive structural reform. And in so doing, what the new Labour did, but what the right, what the Tories do particularly effectively, is uh, they ignore the workforce. Uh, what they do is they denigrate everything that's been before, and as a result, they, 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 um, they end up with a disaffected, alienated workforce. I think Michael Gove could now say that every teacher is uh, worth their weight in gold, and they should all be paid £100,000 a year, and the profession would go, 
bugger off, we don't believe you. Uh, they, they have, you know, it's quite a achievement <coughs> for Michael Gove to be more hated by the teaching profession than John Patton, uh, but we've done some polling and that's the case. So if you just, if you just piss off the service providers, if you just say, teachers, nurses, doctors, civil servants, you're all rubbish and we have to just reform you and not listen to the expertise of the workforce, and indeed the vested interest they have in making things better, then that's not a very good way of doing it. And the third issue around the reform of public services in the way that Thor uh, Sean is talking about is that governments and others are very bad at commissioning. They're very bad at doing contracts which uh, really get the best value out of providers, and too often contracts leave massive loopholes for providers to make profit but not provide a service. Think of A4E, uh, think of G4S and the Olympics. I mean, the idea that private providers can routinely come in and routinely provide a better service, that was blown out of the water there. We only need to look at, and my, my expertise is in education, uh, let's look at free schools in other countries. So that's schools uh, taken over or built and run by private providers. I'll just give two examples. In Sweden uh, this year, uh, one uh, company which um, uh, provided free schools, JB Education, it managed 19 schools. It was brought out by the Danish private equity group Axel in 2008, and in this year, uh, giving three months notice, it shut 19 schools because it didn't make enough profit. Just shut them. Um, the Miami Herald um, has done a very good um, series of reports into charter schools, <coughs> and free schools in Florida. And I'll just give you two <coughs> examples there, and I'll finish with one point. Uh, they found out that the charter schools in Florida, given money by <coughs> what they call taxpayer dollars, uh, they now routinely take a, a disproportionately low number of black children and disproportionately low number of um, low income children and a very disproportionately low income number of children with special educational needs. Now this is in a state which has very, very rigid, very, very fierce uh, equality laws but they're getting around them. And why are they getting around them? Because those children are more expensive to educate. If you educate those children, it impacts, impacts the bottom line. But the best example is one I found yesterday. So, let me introduce you to Fernando Zulueta, who is the CEO of Academica Corp, which manages 80 schools in Florida. During the past 15 years, Zulueta and his brother Ignacio have built Acad Academica into Florida's largest and richest for-profit charter school. And it, no, sorry, it runs 60 schools with $158 million in total annual revenue and more than 20,000 students. Its achievements have been profitable. It received just from one, one area district $9 million a year in management fees for the schools that it runs. But their greatest financial success is that it also has, Academica has now two dozen uh, companies, sub-companies run by Academica. And uh, what they do is they, they act as real estate, they buy up the land, they build the school, then they charge the school upwards of 20% of its annual revenue a year for running the school, that's in addition, that for, the, for the rent, that's in addition to the management fee. So last year, that meant they got $115 million from uh, the, the, the lets, and that's not subject to property tax. Now then, how do you, how, you know, the, 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 you've got Academica running the schools, you've got the CEO making all this money, they build the schools, then they charge 20% rent. But how do you know that it's all fair? Well, Academica's directors are all, one of them, are all of the management boards of each school. And it's the management boards which decide how much to pay in management fees and how much to pay in rent. And as Loretta says, uh, we take our cue from what the board's mission is. The school principal doesn't report to Academica. Well, that's all right then. If you believe that, you believe anything. So of course we need really good public services, and of course they will always need to change and reform. But under-regulated outsourcing to a private sector, which has signally failed to recover itself in glory, which is not normed, which is not poor performed, and is certainly not stormed, is not the right way to go about it. Very good. Thank you. Excellent. That's just what I was hoping you'd say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to ask you <coughs> about that too. I want to just try and isolate. What, what is it exactly that's doing all the work in your dislike of free schools? Is it the fact that they make profits? I mean, in this country, of course, they don't. They don't. So, um, so that's actually a phantom argument for this country. But is, it, is your objection to those examples the fact that they're profit-making? Or is, it the, is your objection that the local authority cannot take control of them? Um, I don't have an in-principle objection to free schools. 
I have an objection to the way they're being operated at the moment. So my objections are around the issues around the majority are not in areas of need. They are already unrepresentative in terms of um, um, the local catchment area. Uh, four out of the nine first preschools, I'm sorry to say this, have failed their offset inspection. And that was at the most, the most high quality bar set for the first round of free schools and um, a, a significant number in need of uh, improvement. And that there is, but my main, my main thing about this is, because I do think interested parents, you know, I don't mind interesting parents, but, but the problem is they're right for taking over by big academy chains who are right for taking over for five big for-profit companies. I mean, if you think the big academy chains are where it's going to end if, they, if the Conservatives get in, then, then that's another thing. But the, but the big issue is about place planning. We are now in a situation where we're facing a, a massive increase in primary pupil numbers, which will feed into secondary uh, pupil numbers, and we know that the, the government has no mechanisms uh, for building the number of, or, or increasing the number of uh, school places in the right areas. And I go to schools a lot. I went to a school last week in Oldham, which now has porter cabins on top of the porter cabins, where children, this, these are the most disadvantaged children, where they can only have half an hour for lunch because then the next lot have to come in, and then the next lot have to come in. And, you know, uh, what they need, and it's been delayed for three years, is a massive expansion of the school. And they can't do that because the local authority doesn't have the powers to get on and give those children the places they need. If, you know, you've got to, as a government, you cannot let the market decide on the national demographic of school places. We could go on, but I want to come to Steve, because <coughs> one of the implications of the argument we've set out is that if you liberalise the system, there's a lot more opportunities for businesses to provide some of these services. And of course, they always have for a very long time. Lots of the subsidiary services in health and education have always been subject to um, ordinary market competition. But now that, that is um, expanding. And Steve Milton is the CEO of the Circle Partnership um, that you will know from health and is uh, interest to expanding. And Steve's been a long time in this business, so he can tell us what it looks like from the other side, Steve. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'd like to talk straight to the central issue of you know, should the NHS um, have the help of organisations like the one I've been part of in tackling the huge challenge that, that Sean laid out at the beginning of the session. And it won't surprise you to know where I'm coming from on this issue. So um, let me get straight into it. Circle is a part employee owned organisation. Um, we're an A-listed company and we're backed by the capital market. So it's an interesting combination of employee um, organisation um, with, with access to capital. Um, we've been running NHS hospitals in the form of treatment centres for seven years now, over seven years, um, and probably most controversially for the last two years, we've been running Hinchinbrook Hospital in Huntington, which is the first full acute hospital um, in the UK to be run by a private operator, which I suspect is why we're here. Um, <coughs> so let, let's just look at the, the problem that Sean was out, <coughs> outlining and, and probably get down to the granularity of the level of distress um, that we're seeing. If you look at the Trust Development Authority, it's supervising over 100 um, non-foundation trusts. Um, over half of those are not on track for foundation trust status. This week they published a report to show that 30 out of the 62 acute trusts under their supervision will be making a deficit this year. And the problem is not just limited to non-foundation trusts. Over 40 of the foundation trusts um, in England today are in breach of monitors' guidelines on financial sustainability. And uh, again, Sean referenced Bruce Keir's report um, six of those 11 and special measures are indeed foundation trusts. So I think you know, not only is there a significant financial problem, but actually we now have a new dimension to add to that, which is the transparency that's come out of um, the Francis report on mid-staffs has um, now opened our eyes to the fact that you can not only fail on financial terms, but you can fail in quality um, terms as well. So I guess the, 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 the thing I want to get across is this is a problem that is growing and will continue to grow. But at the same time, the options available to the NHS are limited. Um, the conventional wisdom is that mergers and closures will solve all these ills. But the reality is <clears throat> there's little appetite amongst good foundation trusts to merge with core hospitals. There is little track record or little evidence to suggest that when they do, you get a good result out of it. And as far as closures are concerned, patients quite rightly expect to get access to high quality healthcare services in their own locality. If I just project, um, yeah, an image of the patients, the average patient sitting in our Hinchinbrook Hospital at the moment is a frail elderly patient who with varying degrees of dementia. The idea of them jumping on 
the scarce public transport on the A14 to spend an hour and a half getting to Addenbrooke's hospital is just frankly laughable and that for basic healthcare needs which should rightfully be available to them in their locality. So I think the fashion for closures, um, patients are against and politicians rightly are picking up that that's not really tenable. So what you're left with is getting inside these hospitals and transforming their, their you're getting more for less, transforming their performance based on culture, behaviour and quite frankly leadership. And really that's the space that we've been operating in the last two years. So I just wanted to share very quickly um, the progress we've managed to make in those early stages. Um, when we took on the hospital, I think Earl Howe rather colourfully in Parliament described Hinchinbrook as a clinical and financial basket case. It certainly had severe quality and um, financial issues. Um, we set about applying our methodology to um, running that hospital, aligning the whole organisation around a single purpose, which is to become one of the best hospitals in the UK, and then applying our methodology, which is to put clinicians in charge of the services they deliver, which might sound pretty common sense but actually it's not common practice in, in healthcare today and then supporting them with the very best methodologies for continuous improvement to business excellence that we can draw from, <laughs> from across a whole variety of UK industry sectors um, where we have some pretty good expertise. An um, example would be my background in retail, I think the UK retail sector is regarded pretty rightfully as one of the most efficient and high performing in the, in the world today. And the results we've, we've managed to get from the early stages are pretty impressive. Um, in our first year, we, quality, we focused on the quality and safety turnaround of the organisation. Um, we've achieved full compliance with CQC um, regulation in our, since the very first time that the CQC inspected the hospital in the last year. We've halved the number of serious incidents that have occurred um, compared to the previous year. Our A&E four-hour performance, which has been um, much talked about in the media for, for across um, the NHS in the last few months, has gone from, we were 140, 104th in the UK in the final quarter before we took on over the whole of last year, Hinchinbrook Hospital was the fourth best acute trust um, A&E for our performance in the UK, sorry, in England. Um, as far as patient experience is concerned, we've had a 20 fold increase in patient feedback and the last two reporting periods on the NHS's friends and family test, that's the one where we ask patients would they refer your healthcare services to their friends and family. We've been the top acute trust in England in the last two periods. So I think we've seen you know, what a hospital should be there to do, which is to deliver outstandingly safe and high quality services. We've made <coughs> great progress um, having given the responsibility of that to our doctors and nurses in the front line. And then financially we're on track um, to break even this year. The first year we took over we had a 10% deficit. That's a 10 million deficit on 100 million turnover. Bear in mind Hinchinbrook's probably one of the smallest trusts in the UK. And um, we reduced that to three and a half million in the first year, and after five reporting periods this year, we're on track for break even. So I think what we've shown is that you can actually deliver high quality care at the same time as improving efficiency. Um, the thing that's very striking in healthcare for me is that the cost of quality failure is immense. When you do get things wrong, the costs just spiral. <clears throat> and actually, just getting services right first time for patients um, looks after the bottom line itself. So the issue for me is, you know, having, having shown that, you know, you can take a conventional approach to improving performance in an organisation through applying innovative means is, will the NHS solve its problem on the scale it's got to run it without significant innovation? And history shows us that you don't get significant innovation from the incumbent organisations, no matter how good and well run they are. Um, within industries. You know, a simplistic example is you know, Microsoft didn't invent Google, Google didn't invent Facebook, Facebook didn't invent Twitter, and I'm quite sure Twitter won't invent the thing that's around the corner that none of us have ever imagined. So our value as a new entrant is that we're not encumbered by a deep commitment to doing things the way they've always been done. We come at it with a fresh pair of eyes. <coughs> and for me, that leaves us with the central question for our politicians, which is are they going to foster an environment in which the very best solutions, the most pragmatic solutions can be adopted irrespective of where they come from? Or are we going to allow that playing field to be limited by a narrow ideology around state ownership and control? Steve, thank you very much. Can I just ask you a couple of things? It's interesting what you said about hospital closures. Because there's another case for hospital closures, which is a, a case that comes from success, which is to say there's enough, so many conditions now that we can treat so quickly, people in and out, the hospital very class, lots of things we can treat at home. And these great big Victorian edifices we built are just not the appropriate thing. So the, the case for closing them is not that there's simply no money, 
it's actually they're not needed. I guess what I'm reacting against is the fact that patient needs are generally local and that we should not ignore that. That isn't to say, however, that hospital infrastructure should not be reconfigured. Now, as modern medical practices are, are introduced, and then the, the nature of the infrastructure you need to support their delivery changes dramatically. So we no longer need the Victorian hospitals with hundreds and hundreds of beds because actually the vast amount of elective surgery now is carried out on a day-to-day basis with minimally invasive surgery and so on. So we need to adapt. So a hospital may not be a building as such. It might, it might, we might think of a hospital as a, as a series of services. Yeah, and we need to invest in the infrastructure to actually make sure it's fit to deliver the right kind of care. And, and again, you know, there's a polarisation, I think, that needs to take place in healthcare. The very most specialist um, treatments, you know, for example, if you want heart surgery for for small babies, then frankly it is worth driving three hours off the motorway to get the very best of care from a surgeon who does nothing else but that. But what I'm, I'm looking at is the vast amount of the healthcare we deliver in the hospital is on a much more routine basis. It's, you know, it's, it's giving birth to babies, it's, it's care of the frail elderly. And those services <coughs> should be delivered as close as possible to the community in which the patients live. I have to ask you too about your industrial relations, because it just occurred to me you might be the broker between, in the argument between John and <laughs> And Mary, because one of the things that's always a problem when you try and assert reform services is carrying the profession with you, and you can't do a serious reform to a service unless you've got the profession alongside you. <coughs> and you seem to have a particular way of doing that, which is to say they're essentially given responsibility. Is that has that been critical to, to the success? Well, I think the central idea is that it's widely perceived that people don't like change and we're in the business of how to affecting significant change within healthcare. The reality is, it's not that we don't like change, it's we don't like change we're not in control of. And so the reality, what we're trying to do is take the people who are the most expert professionals in our hospitals who are there to deliver services and actually support them in delivering, designing, developing and evolving those services they run. It's really just common sense and we would do that in any industry. In healthcare it's even more important because they're very highly trained, highly skilled individuals. And I guess we've had a, 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 a checkered history in, in the NHS of um, clinical professionals and managers um, getting in each other's way and preventing both parties from getting the very best out of the organization they work for. And we're trying to bring those forces into alignment with managers supporting clinicians who are going, well, actually, I'd like my service to go in this direction. Are we OK? How do I help you? Steve, I think it's all solved. <laughs> I want to come to Chris Skidmore um, to, to finish on before I come over to you. Chris is an MP for Kingswood <coughs> since 2010. Uh, in his former life, a uh, historian, um, and one of a number of historians on the Tory backbenches. Um, and Chris, your thoughts on what we've heard so far? Thanks, Phil. I um, don't know about the audience, but one of the most striking lines I thought in Ed Miliband's speech to the Labour Party conference, which uh, you know, we're still discussing a week on, so it must have been fairly successful is the line, they used to say a rising tide lifts all boats, um, but now we know it's just lifted the yachts. Now for the sort of policy wonks in the room, I mean, you see, many of us will be familiar with that being used in sort of Caroline Hoxby's uh, research <coughs> Harvard about the effects of um, the increase in choice in the public sector. And the very fact I thought that you know, Miliband made that striking statement, you know, a denial of the fact that a rising tide of increased choice would actually lift all boats. I think it's incredibly significant. It's not really been, been picked up by the media. But when you look, obviously, at what his team has been saying you know, over months, over years, and Andy Burden, for instance, going against any qualified provider, returning to any preferred provider in the NHS, to Tristan Hunt saying that you know free schools are a vanity project for young mummies, when it comes to the 2015 uh, general election, there will be a clear choice in a way I think there haven't been for generations about where the future of public services go and the nature of competition and choice within our public services. And you know, the public will have to decide whether they're in favour of choice and competition or they are not. Um, I think <coughs> the Blairite middle way, the triangulation that took place over the past decade was very successful in particularly constituents like mine in Kingswood, once they had the independent treatment centre, they couldn't care who was providing that. All they knew was that it did a very good job. And people would say, oh, I have my knee operation at Emerson's Green Treatment Centre. It's fantastic what they're doing in the NHS these days, you know, Chris. And at the same time saying, oh, well, we can't have any privatisation taking place in our hospitals. And for me, that is still one of the significant issues about public service <coughs> reform, is the issue 
of communication. Now, I have an education sort of background, but when I first got me elected as an MP, I didn't want to be a sort of one-trick pony, as it were, and I thought, well, <coughs> let's go on to health science. So I spent three years sort of learning my, my trade, sitting at Stephen Burrell's feet, and uh, obviously we promised no major top-down reorganisation. I thought, that's fantastic. I'll have partly given five years to sit there to learn what needs to be done, and then the white paper you know, dropped on my desk, and I spent 2010 party conference trying to defend something I barely knew very little about, apart from the fact that we were meant to be keeping sort of PCTs and uh, suddenly they would disappear from what was meant to be in the coalition agreement. Um, but we are now at a stage where Andy Byrne is going to say he's going to repeal that bill in its entirety. Is he really? And that's what I find remarkable is that during that debate, around the issue of communication, we had organisations like the BME, BMA, sorry, um, standing up for PCTs, of which they opposed their creation in 1999. And I, I wonder when the time we get to 2015, by the time we see clinical commissioning groups bedding in, are we really going to turn around and say, hang on a second, we're going to take budgets away from GPs, from healthcare professionals, for running the health service? And I don't think so. I think once we actually have reform in place, you know, we've got to keep on moving and looking forward to actually where is the next ascent that we need to make to look down into to the valleys beneath us. And I, I think when it comes to the issue of communication, so the first issue is, is transparency and data. And in a way, education is a lot further ahead than healthcare. You know, we have the data now in a way we never used to a decade ago, to be able to point out, to map out inequalities in our education system and our healthcare system. But with that data, with transparency, comes the issue of not just sort of pointing out inequalities, but also the inequalities of, of, of failure within any system. And that will mean, just as it has done for schools that have underperformed, that in hospitals, we have to have that argument with the general public. And where we talked about failing schools 15 years ago, we need to start talking about failing hospitals as well. And that those um, hospitals and providers that cannot perform adequately in comparison to their peers will need to be shut down. I think in terms of taxpayers would expect a service where if you have a hospital locally that's not performing, then it needs to be taken over. By another provider. And then the other ex next stage of reform, I believe, is when you look at that data, when you look at actually where we are with free schools, where we are with academies, where we are with standards, when you look at education, for instance, uh, the percentage of um, good or outstanding schools broken down by area. For instance, you know, 80% of children in Dorset and Northumberland attend primary schools that are good or outstanding, but it's just 59% in Shropshire and 56% in North East Lincolnshire. Now, that is interesting in terms of the debate around public service reform has always been around usually deprivation um, and inequality in the city areas. Rightly so, you can see healthcare inequalities and educational inequalities taking place primarily in those areas. But when you look at school reform, as a conservative, we need to now get tough with our own conservative local authorities and actually turn around and say, you are not doing a good enough job. And actually, when it comes to looking at where we are with reform, We've got to a stage now where we've maybe spoken about, obviously, allowing this a bottom-up process. But that has necessitated an inequality taking place where preschools and academies have grown in some areas. But there are lacuna in, in, in entire areas of the country where there has been no reform whatsoever. So where do you go when reform seems to have run its track on a voluntary basis? And personally, I think, you know, this is party conference, I think we've have the opportunity to throw out various sort of pebbles of, uh, of policy. Um, and that is that we need to get to a stage where if local authorities are not going to be part of the solution and they are part of the problem, that we introduce learning trusts like they had in Hackney in order to force through reform where actually recalcitrant local authorities are not pushing it forward. When it comes to looking also at other areas of public services, yes, we can talk about sort of what is the general offer to the, you know, the public, to parents, to patients and their families. But at the same time, the greatest success we will have in public service reform is, is actually still tackling the forgotten people, still tackling chronic conditions. You know, the fact that you know, look at the PERO principle, it works very well in the NHS, 20% of the population responsible for 80% of all costs. When you look at what happened in Camden in Chicago with uh, Jeff Brenner, he set up the Camden Coalition, it was through data to start with that he was able to transform healthcare in that area because he was able to use health mapping. It couldn't, you know, we have prime mapping now, but he managed to pinpoint exactly who were the patients who had the chronic conditions and go and find them. 
And that is something that we need to look at in public services. It's far too reactive. You know, GPs with a patient population of only 2,000 people <coughs> sit there and wait for them to come into their surgeries. You know, as an MPI, I do not just simply wait for people to turn up my surgeries. I go out and knock on the doors and find the problems. And we also need to look at that for healthcare, I think. And controversially, payment by results. Uh, Mary's probably not going to agree, but we take, for example, pupil referral units. Some of the toughest pupils of which 0.5% get five good GCSEs, and often with pupil referral units you'll find them to be the conveyor belt to young offenders institutions. But we now accept that we're going to have payment by results of the justice system. Why can we not have payment by results when it comes to pupil referral units? And just finally to, to sum up, we are in a changing you know, world. We're going to have to change to stay the same. And this comes back just to the health and social care bill, because I think having set out the case for reform, we have actually only really gone halfway there. You know, we've been obsessed about institutional reform and changing structures and systems. We know we need to move towards a system of integration. And Phil talked about the fact that hospitals may close if we can deliver healthcare in better settings in the community. And yet, to do this, I don't think it's going to be a simple case as Burnham's talking about with health and social care and trying to create some other institutionalised revolution. It's going to be through the person. And we, I think we need to move away from public services revolution to a personal revolution and talk about personal revolutions in public services. Because it will be personal budgets that have worked so well for um, patients um, on continuing care within the NHS for the, in disability world that we need to now adopt for those patients with chronic conditions who we can map people with diabetes who cost 25% more NHS costs. That is the future. And if we turn our, you know, our eyes and our sight away from the goal that we will always continually have to reform to stay the same, you know, we will miss out. We've got this opportunity in 2015. The crossroads are here. And we've got to make that argument and set out in clear terms exactly why we do need to continue to reform. Thank you. Chris, thank you very much. I'm intrigued that you were surprised by Andrew Lansley's uh, bill, just like everybody else was. Um, and it just strikes me something that Mary says, a very important point, that governments do always get tempted to do structural reform. Mm. It's certainly true of the, the Blair government. And it's in a way, it's because that's what you can do. You can change the badges on things quite easily. But actually the thing in education, for example, which we know makes more difference than anything else, is the quality of the teaching stock. And that's much harder to change. And isn't this government a bit guilty too of reaching for structural reform because that appears like activity? It appears like it's doing something. Well, I think the, the tragedy with the health and social care bill was that it masked the fact that it, it was an enormous um, transfer of trust to professionals. That we, you know, taking back um, you know, the spectre of GP fund holding, we were giving the budget and the trust to GPs as opposed to managers to actually take those, those clinical clinical But crucially, decisions. as opposed to consultants as well. The idea that this body called professionals who all agree with each other is, of course, a great myth. Yes, they but... They can't stand each other. <laughs> that is true. Well, they're my father-in-law on this question. <laughs> <laughs> but even with... Even with we, I mean, that is an issue, I think, also with innovation. That actually, innovation is very hard to push in, in the NHS. And I think the government, if it's going to do anything, is to be the champion of innovation push forward what works. And in some areas, you know, it already exists within the NHS. There are consultants and GPs working well. In my own area in Bristol, um, we have GP care that's been set up and they have a triaging system, not simply to put off, um, you know, to affect your meet down meetings with GP, but actually the GP can ring up the consultant. If the consultant doesn't know, then it's straight away you have that sort of communication between GPs. And it's taking place. It may be slow, but you know, we are getting there. You've all been really brief and said something that's a remarkable for them to go, uh, for these sort of things. I was saying to Mary before, I once did an event with John Prescott, where on the way there I said to him, make sure you tell them how many points you've got to make before you start, so they get a sense of how long it is to go. And he stood up and he said, I have 37 points to make. <laughs> <laughs> the immortal words, and 29thly, most people expired in the, <laughs> in the audience. We, we've not heard that. That was, that was admirably concise uh, with real content. And now it's your turn to, to pitch in. Um, if you can be as concise as they were uh, and come to a question, just tell us who you are, then we'll take a few and come back every now and then to the panel. Yes. I'm a medical practitioner. And uh, I would only have two points to make. 
One is on quality from the patient's point of view. See, life and death is absolute, easy to uh, itemize as to how many collective statistics. But there are other grades of quality which it do affect the patients, and uh, I don't think anybody is quoting us. So, for instance, an 80 year old woman, I think the chairman made a point that we don't need any hospitals. For a day case, she has to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, get three hours of travel to the premise of, uh, premises where she's going to be operated. To my mind, it's got a tremendous quality of life. On top of that, the clinical indications for the patients to be operated on have been, the, the, the bar has been set too high. So again, an 85-year-old patient, and uh, these anecdotes are not mere anecdotes. They come from different areas and are, are developing a pattern. She gets, she can't see. She goes to see the hospital. The hospital says, well, you're not too blind. You'll have to wait a year and then come back. And the same consultant who examines her says, it is clinically indicated. I'll do it in a private hospital. A man with hernia goes, a working man, whose time is quite important compared to the 85 year old perhaps, he can't get the operation because the waiting loss is over a year. Now he can't leave the job, so again he goes privately to get So I'm putting to you is, is there any way we can collect the data on the on those patients who are refused the treatment and then perhaps analyze those as to what real state of quality of care is. Okay, thank you. And the, I think the... Uh, Nearly done. <laughs> all right, I'll leave it. <laughs> right, yeah. I'll, I won't make the second one. <laughs> yes. Uh, hi, I'm Mr. Rastani, I'm Fabio Lugia. Um, I wondered if Mary could respond to the customer's point about introducing pen-by results to the PRE. Yep, I'm sure she will. Certainly <laughs> ask. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I think it was a great deal of sense in what Sean said, but I take, take Mary's point about there's been failure in, in some commissioning, um, A4E and being one key case. I mean, I know my, my brother-in-law was a government agency, and I know they, they wrote such a bad IT um, commissioning years ago. When he started work there five, five years ago, they were still using 486 computers because that's what's been specified in the, in, the, in the commissioning. And I think many of the failures are because civil servants <coughs> are quite lousy at writing contracts, enforcing contracts, and renegotiating contracts. And the question really is, uh, what can be done to make civil servants a little bit more business savvy and stop the private sector eating their lunch? Okay, well, let's take a couple more, um, and then I'll come back to the panel. Yes, right at the back. <coughs> Graham Earls, just a private citizen. Um, I wondered whether you can really have competition in healthcare, given that most people don't have a choice over which hospital they go to. I'm less suspicious about education, where I think people can choose schools and consumers can make choice, but I do think in healthcare there's a real problem. Okay, and sir? Um, I'm a council of the Cheshire West Council. I want to pick up the point about the difference in education standards in different authorities. Uh, what I've seen in my time as an elected councillor is um, very few of my colleagues have got any experience of, uh, of real world um, organisational change, and therefore I think. There is a problem in, in some authorities in, in the people who come through all the political parties having the skill set to manage change. Uh, I come from a manufacturing industry background where I've had to make regular changes in, in my businesses, but I think I see a real weakness <coughs> and, 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 and some people are afraid of the change that they, they know they have to make in, in these times. Okay, Mary, let's come to you first. Um, the direct question on payment by results, <coughs> but also if you want to reflect on the commissioning point. Um, I, I don't think paper by results is uh, a good way of dealing with the most complex and difficult of our young people. I mean, if you go to a PRU, you really, you really are in, in, you really have severe and complex uh, needs and, and many different needs, and it's very difficult to categorise. If you think about a payment by results, first of all, you have to think what the result would be, because it's not the same result for each child who comes to a PRU with severe, often. It's not just that they've got social and psychological needs, they've often also got profound learning difficulties. They may have autism, 
uh, they may be they may be uh, have uh, you know an inability to concentrate, uh, and that's often mixed with uh, the most profoundly dysfunctional uh, home environment. It's very difficult to see what the problem <coughs> would be for the result because the results have to be multi-grained and, and granular. Can I just take one or two things mm. that uh, other people said as well? Um, it's really interesting in Chris's talk that he talked about um, reform, and he <coughs> ended by saying we shouldn't be concentrated. You know, we have to move on structural reform. But nearly everything you said was about structural reform, and you made two sort of, I think, two, 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 um, two uh, things which are are, are are confusing that way. Uh, you know, when you look at, for example, if you look at London and you look at London schools, and you look at the transformation of London from essentially uh, an area where it had failing comprehensives to now an area which outperforms um, other, uh, ev when you consider the, uh, the intake of London schools, it outperforms nearly ev any other area in the country. Was that done through a mass program of academies? No, it wasn't. It was done through London Challenge. It was done through schools, and this is an inconvenient fact for the choice. It was done through uh, the, the government commissioning local authorities. <laughs> what? Uh, Cambridge assessment given £141 million pound private contract to run schools in Islington. Uh, well, uh, well, uh, uh, London, London Challenge was largely done by, it was at Stephen Twig, by schools being given the, uh, uh, by, by advice to going to school and saying what do you want, and good schools being partnered with uh, failing schools and working together to raise the standard of all. So that is not, it, you know, it's interesting when you talk about it, we have to move beyond structures, so that's where you actually uh, move to. And I think, and the idea just finally, that public service isn't, um, you know, used to reform. Let's just think what's happening in education at the moment. We've got a new primary curriculum. We've got a new curriculum at secondary, at key stage three and key stage four. We've got revised GCSEs. We've got revised. We've got standalone AS levels. We've got standalone A levels. We've got a new Ofsted inspection system. We've got uh, a new performance management system. <coughs> we've got um, payment. Um, uh, individual pay uh, with the national pay st uh, structure for teachers gone. It is reform on a massive scale. And my argument back to you is the public service is actually awash with reform. It is unsustainable. And if the private sector was subject to that amount of reform, it would be seeing great difficulties as well. It's massive reform in the public service. It's great. There's loads to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, do you want, to, do you want to respond? Um, in terms of, it's interesting what you say about local authorities. In you know the debate we will be having, I guess, in the next couple of decades around the responsibility of local authorities should they be in education altogether. Um, personally, I remain doubtful that they they will. Um, I think that you know, we're moving to a stage now that if we can have experts, um, learning trusts coming in to take the place with that expertise, with the skill sets <coughs> of education. I I don't see why local authorities shouldn't vacate that that patch personally. Um, when it comes to the payment by result, I mean, this is the, the issue. The interesting thing around when we have any debate around public sector reform, you know, the, the, it's almost with the Nixon China scenario, the Labour Party is far better able to, to get away with things that the Conservative Party could never do. Um, you know, the very fact that we did have sort of big private sector contracts being given to on block an entire local authorities um, like Islington just seems to have gone sort of past the wayside. You know, the fact if, if the Conservative Party could be absolutely out for. When you look at payment by results and um, private providers for education, the, the one person who will go down in history for introducing the profit motive into state schools in this country is Ed Balls, who did so with studio schools. Did anyone bat an eyelid? No. We did. And that is the, the communication. I don't think he meant to do it. <laughs> it makes it very difficult. You know, for the Conservative Party, but the Conservative Party should also be a challenge for the Conservative Party to be on their guard. And you know, when it comes to communication, look at what Gove did compared <coughs> to what Lansley did. Um, you know, I, I used to work for my Gove Special Advisor. We spent years trying to prepare the ground, putting down published questions to get some sort of data, which would then show this inequalities that will then be in the paper so actually we could explain <coughs> the narrative. And I think the problem with healthcare is there was no narrative that should have been explained before then the policy was announced and, and then that was obviously where we didn't take the population with us in the same way we could do with education. And just on that point on communication, just thinking back about things, because one of the other things I forgot to mention of a concern of mine is to do with accountability 
Um, Mary mentioned about Academy Chains, obviously that's going to be interesting if, if Academy Chains end up being you know, one chain being more successful than another, another chain failing, where does that leave us in the schools? But I remember having this debate with Dominic Cummings, who's also sort of a special advisor. And I wanted to go down the US route, but Dominic wanted to go down the Swedish route. Um, and Dominic wanted to go down the Swedish route because it seemed European and seemed more friendly. And it goes to you know, communication-wise, we, we'd be able to solve Sweden easier than we would the US, or the US nasty sort of you know, healthcare issue. And then we talk about sort of US healthcare, everyone thinks that we're going to follow that model, it's simply not the case. But the US, I felt, had a you know, model of a charter. And that is the other issue, is of what happens when inevitably, as will be the case, an academy or a free school does fail completely. And I think to protect the project of public sector reform, we haven't properly addressed that issue with accountability in the view. Personally, I'd like to see a system where there may be a, you know, the charter, a you know, seven-year period, a ten-year period to turn around a school, and if you haven't delivered it, the charter is removed. Okay. Sean, I'm interested in your thoughts on commissioning, because one of the real problems with these sort of quasi markets is the specifications that are built into them. They are awful, aren't they? And, to, and that capacity of central government to create these markets, or, which is what has to happen, is really poor. So we always talk about it as though they, they function perfectly. Mm. But actually, they're just human creations, and we're not very good at it. Yeah, I'm, actually, I see a real positive in this. So it's, you know, the arguments against, the, like the examples Mary used, these sort of mad examples that in America where they're commissioning the same. The same services that they're providing, you know, th those are things we can fix. You can rewrite a contract. The chap here, you said your <coughs> examples you mentioned, you know, the public sector and the history of public services is, is littered with these mad contracts that civil servants that have never had a proper job, they've come into the service at age, you know, 21, and and they 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 work for a couple of years, and then there's two or three, and I know this because I've been in government, I've, I've watched it happen. There are like three or four you know, low-grade civil servants working on a contract, and the bid team for the private big outsourcing firm is like, you know, it's 250 people who've spent their whole lives doing this stuff, and they will get, you know, ripped off unless you, unless you beef up those um, skills. I think we should just scrap the civil service functions, half of them, and, and bring in proper private sector experts that do this in areas like retail, where they do play hardball, but they get really good results. And you can, if you can pay people decent money to attract them into the public sector to do that, it will make huge savings. They're doing it in the U.S. in, in the Defense Department. Uh, I think the MOD is actually following the same same uh, example. I'll just finish on one point. The principle must be that the best possible providers provide the service, not any ideological thing about what sector they're from. And the arguments against all of this are always ones about the failure of competition and failure to write a contract, giving people services who died three years ago is obviously stupid, but that doesn't mean the private sector is wrong or charities can't run anything. It's a no. problem with contracting commissioning. We can fix that. That's great. Steve, could you respond to the medical points? I'm particularly interested in the, the, the perennial question of do we wait too long before we do anything? So costs always get increased because we, we have to wait till something's really gone horribly <coughs> awry before we ever intervene. Uh, what, at the individual patient level? Yeah. Um, well, there are a whole variety of points um, raised, so uh, can I cherry pick my way through them? Go on, then. as long as you're quick. <clears throat> um, I think you're, you're just picking up on your point last. I think the one thing that there is a clear consensus on across the whole political spectrum, plus across commissioners, plus across providers, is that integrated care is one of the key levers for driving better value in the uh, in our healthcare <laughs> services going forward. And I think there's a myriad of barriers to immediately adopting that, um, not least structural, the way that people are paid, the way people have always worked and so on, but I don't think there's any doubt that if you look at, at any joined up pathway of care, that uh, education or prevention or early intervention is a lot better than late intervention. You know, and a, and a patient, for example, with a chronic condition such as diabetes ending up in an intensive care unit, the, the costs are self-evident, but equally the benefits to patients are self-evident if we can just join up the care and do it in a much more proactive way. <coughs> and I think that's what largely the whole health community is pointing towards. And I have to say, a quick nod back to Angela Lansley, it does look like the better <coughs> CCGs that have found their feet most rapidly are actually going to be quite um, a decisive force in, in driving that agenda forward. Certainly the ones that we're working with who have got their teeth into that agenda are being very innovative and um, we, for example, have just um, been nominated preferred provider on a musculoskeletal service in Bedford. 
um, where we will be the integrator across all of the services provided to patients in that arena and hopefully bring some of our skills about bringing people and aligning them to benefit patients. So that'd be what I sell integrated care. And there are a couple of other little points. Um, there, there are a number of points I think that you 